Thank you very much indeed, Damon. And thank you everybody for joining the meeting today and welcome and uh, lovely to see old friends and uh, those perhaps I haven't met before. So it's uh, wonderful to be here, especially at this uh, season of, of Christmas. So as we approach Christmas, we're very likely to be busy preparing in some form to celebrate this very ancient festival, albeit perhaps in a quieter way than we might have chosen to do. For many people, it may have little meaning now. For others, an opportunity to meet with family and friends, to eat, to drink, and to give and receive gifts and good wishes. Even if we have little insight into its deeper meaning, the season of goodwill can often be felt with an increased sense of love and peace in the world and amongst our friends and others. But can we discern a deeper meaning? Most in the West will know it is supposed to celebrate the birth of Jesus, the child who is said to be the savior of mankind. But for many, this may mean very little, especially as the story seems unlikely historically. What is the story? Although I'm sure you're familiar with it, I think it's worth summarizing quickly. And it's mainly found in the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. And just to summarize quickly, Mary, a virgin, Jesus's mother, is told by an angel to expect a child to be born of her by virtue of the descent of the Holy Spirit. She and her husband-to-be, Joseph, have to travel to Bethlehem for a census. As there is no room at the local inn, they are offered a stable with the animals where then the child is born. At that moment, the angels sing in the heavens, the shepherds in the fields hear this good news and come to find the boy. Later, three kings or wise men, following a star, also come to worship him and offer gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. Herod, the local king, fearing the loss of his kingdom due to a prediction that he will do so by one born in Bethlehem, has all the children in Bethlehem killed. But the Holy Family have already fled to Egypt, Joseph having been warned in a dream to flee. That is, in a nutshell, the story that we know. But is this story uniquely Christian? And you may be surprised to know that it is not at all. The same story is told in some of the legends of Horus, the son of the ancient Egyptian Isis and Osiris, on four tomb carvings in the temple of Luxor from 17, 1700 BC. The angelic announcements, the shepherds, the nativity scene with ox and ass, the three wise men, Isis, the divine mother was called by all the same names as Christianity uses to denote Mary. Queen of the heavens, star of the sea, immaculate lady, mother of God. And she was often depicted suckling her babe Horus with a cross carved on the back of the statue. Similarly, the stories around Mithras of Persia, who was called Adonis by the Greeks, with almost identical stories in parts, and his birth celebrated on what we now have as the 25th of December. He is called the invincible sun, Sol Invictus, born on the day the sun is born anew in the stable of Aegeus. 
there are similar elements in other world saviors in a sense. Queen Maya, mother of Gautama Buddha, dreamed of a six-rayed star of rosy pearl color entering her womb before his birth. Devaki, mother of Krishna, had to flee the slaughter of children, with Krishna then having to grow up among cowherds. It's perhaps interesting to note as an aside that cows, of course, are sacred in India, as they are in other ancient lands too. And they're also symbolic of the mother nurturing her young with milk, a major theme again in ancient Egypt. So the similarities of these, of these stories suggest something of much more universal significance. The story of the solar savior God. It is worth remembering that ancient stories are myths. That does not mean they are fictional. On the contrary, they represent archetypal principles and processes. Actions on earth are but shadows of these processes. First in heaven above, then on earth below. First, things occur in the real before they are manifested as images in the unreal. And stories are one of the best ways and most memorable ways to pass on information to humanity from one generation to the next. They're easier to remember as stories. And these myths combine some history, some legend, some mysticism. But more importantly, they are relevant at many different levels of manifestation of creation. They are relevant from the point of view of the creator, from the point of view of creation, and from the point of view of the individual human spiritual journey. And in these stories, symbols are used, often with very recognized meanings in the ancient wisdom languages. Symbols which communicate inwardly and outwardly something of the fuller meaning that they embody. They are a gateway to the truth that they represent. And particularly your intuition can be invited to discover that meaning for yourselves. You don't necessarily have to be told what it is. And in these stories, when one tries to interpret them, each actor in the story represents an archetype. And some of these archetypes, when it becomes more relevant to us as humans, include aspects of ourselves. So to return to the solar myth, and starting with creation, as it were, there is but one God, the Absolute, who creates all the universes. All manifestations or creations occur with three qualities or a trinity. Anyone who creates will know that there are at least three aspects to anything that one creates. At the very least, the creator, the created, and the connection between the two. The sun in our solar system is a body or a vehicle and a symbol of the logos, the word, often called the second person of the Trinity in Christianity. And this quality is especially associated with life, light, and love. And this Logos, as a son of God, descends into the material world of matter. 
So this is the sun symbol of this Logos. And therefore his representative on earth, his ambassador, if you like, his avatar and teachers are also symbolized as a sun. And the life of his ambassador or his avatar mirrors the course of the sun on earth. And therefore, the life of his representative will tell the same sun myth story. As Annie Besant so clearly tells us in her book, Esoteric Christianity, the solar myth tells of, one, the activity of the Logos, the word in cosmos. Secondly, the life of his ambassador. And thirdly, because humanity is made in the image of God, we are sons of God. And thus the myth also tells the story of the spiritual journey of humanity. The hero in the solar myth is a god or a demigod whose life, as we said, follows the course of the sun. So he is always born at the time of greatest darkness on earth, in the northern hemisphere, the winter solstice. As the days begin to lengthen again as a symbol and a fact of the rebirth of light. The solar hero dies, as it were, at the spring equinox, a letting go of the shorter days, which are now becoming longer. And he dies on the mystic cross, which can be formed by the winter and summer solstices, crossed by the spring and autumn equinoxes at the 21st of March and the 21st of September. In a sense, therefore, he is crucified on the time frame of the year. And conquering death in resurrection, he rises to the mid heaven, the summer solstice in full shining glory. He ripens as the fruit of earth to grow into full spiritual maturity. And because he is a representative of life, he ripens the fruits of earth, anciently symbolized as wheat and the grape. And these he then feeds to his followers, allowing them to partake of his life and therefore his raised consciousness. You may notice that I've mentioned death in this story so far, as well as birth. And of course, birth and death are but opposite sides of the same coin. What we call birth into matter, our birth, to the soul is rather more of a death, a limitation, certainly. Whilst death from our personal point of view, when we discard our physical bodies, is a birth from the point of view of the soul, a liberation back into a freer world. And thus, you could say what we, what we call birth is death into the tomb of matter. And death is a birth out of the tomb of matter. And both are necessary for spiritual growth in this incarnational experience. The death date of the hero is variable, depending on the relative positions of the sun and the moon after the spring equinox. The animal assigned to the incarnated God depends on the sign of the zodiac of that age which changes with the precession of the equinoxes. Thus, Ioannis of Syria was represented as a fish, Pisces, 
and Mithras and Osiris, sometimes linked together, Osiris, Apis, as Serapis, the bull of Taurus, the ram of Ares, again Osiris, and Jesus sometimes and often called rather the lamb of God, although of course he's also symbolized with a fish too. Returning again to the great scheme of the solar myth, we look at the, let us look at the descent of the Logos first, so from the point of view of descent. And this we can symbolize by the downward pointing triangle of the Trinity manifesting into matter. And then we have that mirrored by the, in the upward pointing triangle as the aspiration of nature and humanity to return back to the source. And the two, of course, form the interlinked six-pointed star. And this reminds us of Maya's dream of the six-pointed star entering her womb to give birth, as it were, to the Buddha-to-be. Many of you will know that the six-pointed star is traditionally a representation of creation, heaven and earth combined, often with a point in the middle, which gives you, of course, an element of the seven rays, which is part of the creation understanding. So creation starts with the absolute, the single point, which then draws a circumference in closing space in which that creation will form. So then space is the mother of creation. In Hindu mythology, she is called Aditi and her son, the sun, S-U-N, Aditya. In the Christian language, we have the idea in Latin of mare, the sea, M-A-R-E, the waters over which the Holy Spirit hovered at the dawn of creation, as we are told in Genesis. So Mary is seen as the divine mother of the universe. In the Eastern Orthodox churches, she is called Theotokos, mother of God, because it gives birth to the God Son principle. And so in her, the Son, the second person of the Trinity is born or manifested. And he is born not from the consequence of duality or two parents, but from out of the Trinity itself, a flowing of creation. And therefore, He's not really an only son of Christianity as traditionally described, but perhaps described as an alone born son, alone from out of the Trinity. And therefore, Mary remains a virgin, unaffected by all these processes. This insight comes from C.W. Leadbeater in The Science of the Sacraments. This son incarnates or takes on a body. Carne, of course, is flesh in Latin. As the consciousness descends through the increasingly dense planes of matter, the densest, darkest is earth. And hence he is often said to be born in a stable, which in those days often were in a cave. Amongst the animals, especially those who are four-footed. And four is a number of earth, traditionally, the square as a symbol, and the lower nature, hence the four-footed, the, the animal nature. Joseph is present in the story, but not the father of the divine son in the myth. He can be seen as representing mind, present, guiding, intuiting, protecting the mother and the child, and the soul, 
as Geoffrey Hodgson suggests in Christ's life from nativity to ascension. But God remains the divine father. This is some way of understanding the symbolism encompassed in this story. Let us have now a look at the life of the divine ambassador, the avatar, if the incarnation of the divine, or a teacher, if less fully expressed. And the life of the solar myth, as it were, is very closely linked to the journey of humanity back to its source. The very great secret or key to all spiritual teachings unveiled by the ancient wisdom is that each person is made in the image of God. Each person is of the divine nature in essence. This is a very common teaching in, for instance, Hinduism, but often forgotten in Christianity. But it is there, especially in St. John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And later, this is the light that lights every man coming into the world. Christ in you, the hope of glory, as St. Paul puts it, and Jesus too elsewhere, you are God's. Humanity has forgotten this fact in its immersion into matter. And through the experience of life, humanity rediscovers this divine nature within. Our journey of life, if we learn its lessons, teaches us that at the core of each person is love, trying to express itself, however hidden that love may appear to be sometimes. And in its attempt to express itself, our true self lets go or allows to die, if you like, the restrictions of matter, the illusions, the unreal, created by mental patterns and stories that we learn to call me and that we have accumulated from our experience during our incarnation, from our own lives and from society and belief systems. And so when we let go of these constructs of mind, and when we let go of the busy chatter of the small mind, which you might experience yourself in meditation for a fleeting moment, then we can find peace and love as the core of our being. Then we can, we can walk upon the waters of the stormy waters of life, for we are above them and unaffected by them. This is one of the symbols, of course, of death and resurrection, a letting go and finding life and love and peace as the core of our being. It's helpful perhaps to look at who we are in a little bit more detail as human beings. St. Paul tells us we are a body, if you like, a soul and a spirit. The ancient wisdom, and particularly in our theosophical teachers, gives us more detail, although we sometimes have to just tease out the language a little. And I find it helpful, as I'm sure most of you already know, to see ourselves as a personality, the coat that we put on at birth, primarily the physical body, the etheric, which is the energy field that organizes it, the emotional and the lower mental planes. 
and then what I would call the soul of the higher mental, intuitional and partly spiritual material, the Atma Buddhi Manas in Sanskrit, and then spirit as Atma higher still and the monad, the one. And therefore, we can say that our true self is the soul and above that, the spirit. And so this Christ in you is the principle of our core soulness, as it were. In other religions, this might be called Krishna consciousness or Buddhahood. The name is far less important than that it is the quality of love, life, light to be experienced within yourself. Of course, this makes no religion exclusively true, a very important lesson for Christianity. The saying sometimes quoted as an aside of nobody reaches the Father but by me, as in Christ's words, as a principle within yourself is absolutely true. We can only reach the spirit higher um, in ourselves through the soul, and the soul has the qualities of love and life. But the name is not the important fact when it is um, described in an exclusive way at all. It is the essence of who we truly are. And this spiritual journey of rediscovering this fact of our true nature is the essence of all religions. It's the point that they're supposed to be pointing towards to help us on our way. And the expression of this historically has often been most experiential in the ancient mysteries. And these historically were the most sacred and often secret schools in Egypt, in Greece, in Chaldea, in Crete, but also less formalized and perhaps on a smaller scale in India and elsewhere too. And in the ancient mysteries, they often used rituals to create the experience of these truths. And the enactment would be based on the story of the incarnated God. And the candidate would represent him because the, he is, of course, a representation of humanity because we are all one in him. So to look at the Christmas story itself in more detail, the conception is in the Virgin Mother. There is an astrological and astronomical aspect to this. Could be said to be astrologically Virgo as the days shorten in September after the equinox. And the birth is at the winter solstice with Virgo rising. Interestingly, the stars in the constellation Virgo include those named Spika, S-P-I-K-A, the head of corn. And the three stars in Orion's belt traditionally are called the three kings. Mother Mary, as I've already suggested, can represent the divine space from a cosmic point of view in which creation takes shape, is born. The circle, as it were. Mary also represents the natural world. As nature gestates through life experience, the birth of the new divine consciousness, the sun, the expression of love and wisdom. wisdom. Mary also represents the soul in man, now ready to receive the spirit, the father, buddhi as a vehicle of atma. And the beautiful image, therefore, of the mother with the divine child is almost universal as a principle of these links 
of birth, of consciousness. In the story, the name of the now inconsequential village is Bethlehem, which means apparently house of bread, representing both the physical body, but especially containing the bread of the sun aspect. Christ calls himself, again in St. John's Gospel, the bread of life. The stable may symbolize the earth. Animals are present. Animals are domesticated and thus obedient to the human nature. Symbolic of the taming of our own animal nature in which the birth can then take place in that space, as it were. The date is now celebrated as the 25th of December, three days after the shortest day. The sun is beginning to strengthen and grow again, promising new growth and life. In the ancient mysteries, during the ceremonies mirroring the dying and resurrection phase of growth, the candidate would be symbolically dead whilst traveling in consciousness through the inner worlds. The body having been laid on a cross or in a sarcophagus if it was in the Great Pyramid. And after three days, the candidate would be brought out and placed to face the rising sun, now resurrected. A second birth, twice born, as both the ancient Egyptians and Jesus called it. The young child is vulnerable, Initiates, those who took part in these ceremonies, were also called neophytes, which means new plant. And they were also referred to as little children by Jesus. And the world may easily damage these by worldly ambitions, such as the power lust of kings, and hence the slaughter of the innocents as a theme. But these same forces also occur in ourselves as we make a leap of consciousness that is this initiatory process. Whenever we leap in consciousness, we are vulnerable in the changed conditions in which we find ourselves. Biblically, we have the temptation in the wilderness that Jesus experienced after a certain initiation. Those forces challenge us to manifest them and concretize them. The Magi, wise men or kings, can be seen as those who have studied the divine laws and astrology and following perhaps both the star of an astrological sign, but also their own inner intuition, find the divine child born in themselves too. And again, there's the number three, the reflection of the Trinity. Their traditional names have been suggested as linked with planets and qualities. There's Gaspar, linked via Thoth and Hermes as Mercury, the guide in the mysteries, the connector between heaven and earth. Mercury, of course, holding his caduceus and winged feet is the traditional hierophant of the mysteries. And of course, the caduceus is a symbol of the Ingela Pingala and the Kundalini channels, as it were, rising up our spines in humanity, connecting heaven and earth. The second is Melchior, king of lights, perhaps related to Venus and love. And Balthazar, possibly linked to the moon, perhaps the personality. And all three aspects now worshipping the sun, now born again. And some see in the gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh, many of these qualities. They're all trinities, of course, so you can make of it much as you can make it useful to you. Perhaps spirit, soul and personality. Perhaps Atma Buddhi Manas, the trinity in man. Gold is, of course, a light colour and a very purified metal. 
Spiritual incense rises up, connects and purifies. Myrrh is also an incense that is used particularly in healing and embalming. Perhaps again, the transition from earth to heaven. And they've also been suggested as symbolizing the kingly and priestly aspects of Christ's work with sacrificial death combining the two. The star is a very prim prominent symbol in the Christmas story. It is usually five pointed, very importantly, with the point upwards. It is reaching to heaven. It is a symbol of inner intuition, the higher self guiding you. The head chakra, the highest opening and shining, the perfected human being. It is, as you say, it is like a human being, two, two legs and two arms outstretched and the head, a symbol of perfected humanity. It also is said to shine out at the higher initiations of the candidate as a symbol of the one initiator. One who has seen the star is now a member of the great white brotherhood. This is from C.W. Ledby to the Masters and the Path. Shepherds may be seen as those developed spiritual leaders watching over their flocks. And here in the great news of a divine birth announced by the huge joyful choirs of angels, all earth, all creation rejoices as such a moment of the divine birth. These themes of the birth of the spirit in the material earthly world and the perfecting of humanity can also be seen as symbols in some of our common traditions associated with Christmas, which were in fact largely taken over from pre-Christian celebrations. Traditionally, the colors are green and red. So we have the natural evergreen world with the wild brought indoors, whether as tree or log or holly and the evergreen producing red berries or decorated with red and color. So we have the natural world of green, encompassing perhaps the elements of earth and water, producing the spirit of red, the elements of fire and earth. So nature produces spirit as a fruit, as it were. The Christmas tree is actually not such an old tradition in the West, but trees, of course, are ancient symbols in many of the world traditions, whether Christian or Buddhist or Norse or Hindu, both as creation and as man. And as man, we raise our consciousness up through the chakras, setting them spinning in glorious colors till the crown is opened up and the halo shines, or in ancient Egypt, the Kundalini rises up through the forehead, as it were, hence the, the symbol again. The star of perfected mankind, of humanity, or our angelic self, shines forth. So the star and the angel, still often as symbols, adorn the tops of our Christmas tree although the wonderful truth is usually not known. And candles too symbolizes the same, the living flame of spirit consuming the worldly wax, connected by the antikarana of the wick. So we've looked in some detail, although there are far richer symbols to be uncovered still. But the most important is the experience of what these mean for yourself. As Angelus Salesius, a German mystic, wrote, even if Christ be born again in Bethlehem anew, despair, O man, unless he is born in you. 
For the whole purpose of life, of this creation, is to grow into spiritual maturity, to be a human being, knowing and then manifesting your unique self, rooted in the divine one, a true son of God. Christmas is the beginning of the story of this creation as the divine manifests, and the story of the method or way for humanity to return home, now to full consciousness. Avatars have frequently come in our history to show us this way. They taught, and more importantly, they lived the life of love. Their vibration on this earthly plane changed the very vibration and nature of Earth. They went into what appears as the depths of darkness and transformed it into light. They raised the consciousness of humanity back to God. They reconnected the Earth to the universe. Christ and Krishna both brought the teachings of love as their emphasis, the very foundation on which our universe is built. Muhammad and Buddha both proclaimed what is translated as compassion. These two are not just events in history. In the sacred science, we know that time and place do not ultimately exist. And very importantly, our intention, our focus, can link us to the reality we focus on. And so in joining with God, in manifesting again, especially at this time in the Earth's evolution, which is very important, this crisis time, we are part of this process. We too are born again in consciousness. And we are here now to help to give a new impetus of love to this earthly planes. In this new birth, at this Christmas, the angels and all nature indeed again rejoice. Happy Christmas. Thank you. <laughs>